just arriving, so, so do come in. That's quite all right. We're just about to begin. You're very welcome. <coughs> to do what she is not prepared to do herself. 
So it gives me great pleasure, Laura, to hand over to you and to welcome you to, I think, what is a very significant and important moment, which is the professorial inaugural. Thank you. So the cello 
like many external instruments, it's different from the voice. The voice is inside as we carry it with us. An external instrument is something different. And in life, I know Maria quite well, so I can show you a demonstration in life. Unless you know someone quite well, you wouldn't get very close to them. A normal person would say, actually, this is my space, what are you doing? Actually, it might be aggressive or seen as something that it's, it's not, it, why would you do that? But with an instrument, the instrument does come very close to us. It comes into that space. And as a teacher, I need to be aware that when I ask my student to take on board the instrument, to take the instrument, I need to think about how it feels for her. So, the cello is made of wood, it's got some strings, it's got a spike, it's much easier than the violin, you don't have to hold it up in any fancy way. And um, I'm going to start by bringing the instrument to you. So, Maria's wearing a lovely skirt, so she's all set for cello playing. And, um, and we have this beautiful cello, which was given to the university. Um, by the Funtington Music Group for our instrument collection that she gets to play on. So the cello comes to you. So with your left hand, can you reach out and take the cello by the neck and bring it to your body. And it will touch you somewhere on your chest, your tummy chest. There you go. And that's good. It's held up on the floor, so you don't have to support it with that hand. But we're just going to feel what it's like to have it there for a minute. And um, you can feel it. It's touching you somewhere on your legs, somewhere on your tummy chest, and, and you're holding on for dear life at the moment. <laughs> so that's the first step, is to get to know the instrument. The second thing is making music has to do with sound. And it's, that's our first learning out loud, because unlike when you write an essay, or when you walk and you think about things, music has to be done iteratively out loud. I can't practice just in my head and then pop out a finished thing. It takes hours of getting used to this stuff and figuring it out. So the first thing is we're going to make some sound. And I'm not going to do anything to you. You're going to be the learner doing it yourself. So with your right hand, can you make an L shape? Yeah, fab. And then you're going to stick your thumb on the side of the black thing, the fingerboard. Great. Or even on the side. It doesn't have to go under. Yeah. So it's like, a, it's like a railing, you're holding on. And then with the other finger, can you pluck the string? And you will feel the vibrations of the instrument. Yeah? Yeah. Let go with your left hand. <laughs> Good. Another one. Give it a go. You won't break it, I promise. A little bit shy, you might notice. <laughs> Do some more strings. Yeah? Good. Scoot your hand up this way a little bit. I was once told by a wise teacher that you could imagine plucking like it was a harp. Because if you go too near the end, it's kind of hard work. In the middle, like a harp player, it's beautiful and resonant. Give it another go. That's nice. Give them each a go. You got four different ones to give a go. Nice. Fat. And you can feel it where it touches you. So in school, that takes about a month. Okay. We're going to take about five, ten minutes at the end of this. So. And, and what I want to show, I want to show Maria making some sounds. I'm going to teach her two different um, technical pattern -y things. So I'm going to, um, you know, use the bow, do some strings, do some fingers, and just see what that experience feels like. So with the bow, if you take your right hand and place it palm up, yeah, a little further away from the cello because I'm going to set the bow in your hand. So you don't have to do anything. I'll place it there for you. And as an aside, for you guys, I don't need to touch my student. I don't need to manipulate my student. If I am able to explain with clarity, my student can experience this learning for herself. That's very important. When someone does something to you, pulls you through, it's never as effective as when you do it yourself. So, and also there's some other reasons for this that I'll tell you later. So I place the bow in your hand, wonderful, and there's a bit of fluffy on that bow. Um, and I'm going to ask you to put your thumb there. You don't need to twist, you just bring your thumb to it. So a very loose hand, Fab. there, and bring your thumb, yeah. And then I'm going to bring the bow around, I'm going to help. And the bow is going to go onto the string. The vibration is <laughs> stronger, just because it's... Mm. 
Good. So with the bow, which is made of horsehair, we go back and forth. And to change string, we have to change the level of the arm. Do you think you can do that without me helping? You've got the anti-gravity reflex on. You're not going to hurt it. Rest on the job. That's very nice. Do you think you could do two of this one and then two of the next one up?
exercise. Good. We'll just check where your first finger is. Can you put your first finger down on that one? On this string. Yep. Good. Yeah, put that down just to check. Do two of those because we're doing two of everything. That's good. And then take that one off because we want to go back to the open. Yep. That's nice. Can you remember the fingers that went down? So if you put them all back down on the all of them down, because when you walk with your feet, you don't walk on just one toe. Bit of space, down to the ground. Yeah. Okay, and then we're going to roll over there. Little. Good, one finger off. Fab. Back to that one finger, All only one. A little further back than you want. Yeah. <laughs> It's a good thing, and it makes a loop of reinforcement. It makes a good thing loop. 
So as far as achievement, goals are important, but they have to be balanced. So first we need to recognize there is recognition of where I have come, from where? Recognition of where I am. Whitehead said, what we perceive as the present is a vivid fringe of memory tinged with anticipation. In learning and doing, there's a sense of motion, motion forward. The anticipation is the capabilities for what you can do now, an immediate delivery of skills, but they can also be about future development. I can. However, always <coughs> looking forward prevents us from that second bit of recognition, the awareness of where you are. It's tempting to say, I'm getting there. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting there. Well, I am no more there now than I ever will be. Instead, I'm here. I'm right here, in a perpetual state of movement and change, and being exactly here. The important thing about being here is that I know my capabilities, I know them, and I believe in them. I can learn, I can do. My belief in my capabilities for can, learn, and do underpin everything. Goals, actions, resilience, achievement, persistence, satisfaction, and value. There are theories by academics, psychological frameworks, physiological, neurological understandings of how one learns, our mechanisms and processes. The understanding of learning and experience has deepened over time with the growing global network of communication and technology. We know now that learning comes from within. We've seen the pendulum swing from internal to external, back to recognizing that internal mechanisms of cognition, belief, and personal agency are important. This is not new. For example, Socrates speaks in Euthydemus of the need for individuals to learn when he says, since knowledge is what provides this goodness of use and also good fortune, every man must, as seems plausible, prepare himself by every means for this to be as wise as possible. In our own lifetimes, we feel the remnants of an antiseptic view of learning as something that's mass produced and can be just poured into people's heads through rote dictation and regurgitated testing. Fortunately, that tide has receded and we know and understand that people learn for themselves. Institutional learning and I'm speaking of all manners of schools, from primary through to many universities, they tend to have a personalized approach. Many places use textbooks for the learner, curriculum for classes, but that isn't really personal learning by itself, unless you have a clever teacher who encourages and allows for individual differences. Learning is individual. It isn't something you can do to someone, or even plan like a recipe book, or something to work for everyone. The way one person learns cello is going to be very different to another. No two of us are the same. How could our learning be reduced to something that is a single centrally produced manual? At the root of it, you and I decide to learn for ourselves. And we choose the course of action we take, how we find information, who we reach out to, how we connect, how committed we are, how strong our sense of self is, and how resilient we will be. All of that is individual. It is possible to be taught, to experience, and not to learn. Take our cello example. Maria was wonderful, and Twinkle Twinkle was lovely. A little bit out of tune, but our first go was amazing. And is that really learning? So we can be led through the motions to copy and reproduce something, but without our engagement and appropriate time and mechanisms to facilitate and allow our understanding, it can be like a meeting where you can say, I met someone, I met that famous person, but actually you simply bumped shoulders while you were passing. It was a meeting of sorts, but not a meeting of minds. It's not actually learning, not yet. We can experience and not learn for any number of reasons. The learner, the teacher, situational constraints, there are lots of possible unknowns. Still, that's not to say that experiences, even those we think we don't learn from, do not impact us. Everything does in some way. Stephen Downs asked, does an island remember you when you walk on it? And this was in response to a recent neuroscience article about new understandings of how transcription factors in the brain impacts the development of memory. The article questions the understanding of memory and his response with a rather concrete theoretical question made me think, yes, we leave a mark. 
everything we do impacts this planet, and everything we do impacts us. Much like the butterfly effect, a small ripple here may cause waves later in the timeline of our lives. Even when someone does not understand or seem to learn now, it does not mean that their experience is in vain. As learners and educators, we can take an active role in shaping how experience feeds our learning. That island or the woodland, it will sooner remember your footprints if you make a path. And it will remember you yet differently if your path creates a route for rainwater to run and make a new dew pond. Making those footprints, our awareness of process enables growth and transfer. This is true for the early stages of learning, but also at university level and in life. For all of us, you and me, me as professor, me as mother, me as the girl down the road learning stuff. I'm like you, you're like me. We are each on a path, and there is not really a better than or further than. We're each the first person to live our unique lives, and nobody can make progress for us but us. In learning, we can take elements from one experience and transfer them to another. It doesn't have to be the same situation, and it can inform and have a meaning for other areas in our lives. Okay, so what about teaching? We can think about teaching sometimes as sharing knowledge, but sometimes understanding can be hard to find. There's a wonderful example. It's a video, it's in your programs, of an experiment exploring how non-gamers learn to play video games was shared by Dr. Alex Kuros. Now, the husband is a gamer, the wife is not, she doesn't play games. And he does an experiment to see how she learns. He gives her the tools, sets her up in front of the TV with the controllers, but not the understanding needed to best navigate the tasks. He doesn't tell her anything but go. And what he discovers is there are some elements to process that are quite straightforward, and others that are not at all explained, that are anything but intuitive, and without guidance, that learner can take a long and complicated route to do something that could otherwise be quite simple, if only they knew about it first. Learning is like that in many contexts. Noticing, recognizing, and understanding can be tricky. Learning to learn is a skill that isn't something we're often taught. Here at university, students are expected to move towards a path of autonomous learning as they progress through their degrees. The problem is that throughout learning, even at this level, it's so much easier to direct what to do rather than to explain how an individual can approach something for themselves. I propose we need a dialogue. There is importance and value to learning out loud. Learning out loud means having an active awareness of the process as it's happening. People are reticent to do this, and their hesitation has to do with what society and school teach us about what we share, how we communicate, and even basic understandings of external and internal. Society teaches us to gather things, protect and build walls. I think there are already enough walls in this world. We're used to covering ourselves with external symbols and things, and not often are we encouraged or allowed to focus on the processes at the core of what we're doing. These things take longer to understand, partly because they're not things at all. Are we encouraged to share our processes every day? When we learn, and I don't mean popping a fact into our heads, I mean learning as knowing, in terms of assimilating into our practice. This application, learning in action through experience, involves trust. It involves an openness to becoming comfortable with our capabilities, with our achievements, and being comfortable with moving from the known to the unknown. In the interview on Examining Life from 2010, Judith Butler presents a challenge to individualism, where we ask ourselves whether we live in a world where we need each other, where we are there willing to help one another, to address our basic needs. We're not used to feeling or necessarily seeing ourselves in those terms, and I think we need to. I think it's part of the lived experience of learning. The idea of believing in yourself does not mean that you will do everything. Yes, I can is an important starting point, but it is not an ultimatum. It does allow possibility. Self-efficacy, the belief, 
plus agency, which is the gumption to do, is what results in change. I propose that the university, the school, the institution can be the mechanism, the framework for this. If institutional settings are to move from personalized approaches to adopting a personal learning, this will, by necessity, be unique for each learner. In order to maintain coherence and work towards a collaborative ethos or theme, there needs to be a sharing approach. Sharing outward and feedback. The role of the institution is to facilitate a forum for this dialogue to help people learn out loud. Personalized learning and learning out loud, facilitated and guided by a teaching or learning mentor. Not the kind of teacher that points at you and tells you what to do, but the guide is what then is learned and developed within the umbrella of the institution. I believe I can, I believe you can. So this evening, I show you my practice, a practice on the walls, all around the room. We've got 128 days of preparation for this. All the practice, the documentation, the good bits, the struggles, the daily growth. It is, it's posted on the platform called the AppNet, where creative practitioners can learn out loud, was the point, gaining feedback on work in progress, and to be seen. The kind of continual work involved in musical practice is very lonely. It's hard to sustain and certainly different to being in an office surrounded by people while you do your own thing. I found the community environment a lifeline as well as an inspiration. And besides what you see here, there were some 60, 70 odd comments from other people across the world along the way. And they remain on the yeah, that site. I share my process with you because I genuinely believe that we need to open our practice. We need to learn out loud and support one another. Now almost on to the cello. First a quote to say why we sometimes must go beyond words and why the second half requires new words. So this is from Plato's seventh letter. Further on account of the weakness of language, these attempt to show what each thing is like, not less what each thing is. For this reason, no man of intelligence will venture to express his philosophical views in language, especially not language that's unchangeable, which is true of that set down in written characters. The music I'm going to play is beyond words. My learning is more than words. When we teach, we use more than words, text, gesture. We hope to open doors in people's minds. Doors open and doors close. And sometimes people will even stand in your way. And sometimes we brush shoulders with them as we walk past them. Self-efficacy plus agency can equal change. So remember, only you can learn for yourself. And keep in your minds, yes, I can.
Chichester is so proud of you as a professor of learning and teaching in music. Your profess professorial inaugural is an opportunity for you to profess, and you have professed about self-efficacy, um, you've professed about agency, and about learning out loud, for which we are intensely grateful. You've not only done that, but you have professed in the most extraordinary way through the spoken word, through pedagogic practice with Maria, through the text around us, and finally through your performance, which showed a level of virtuosity that was extraordinary. So I would ask you, um, I would ask the crowd assembled here once again to show their appreciation to our professor, Laura Richard. <laughs> 